Stray Talk about conscious business collaboration. I am really excited today because today I have a beautiful woman with me today called Dixie and she has a beautiful Scottish name that she's going to actually say for me because I do not like destroying last names. So Dixie, can you please say your beautiful name for me? Certainly. It's Gillespie. See, I knew I wasn't going to say that right. <laughs> and what I'm really excited about is I met Dixie at a beautiful retreat called The Go-Giver God over a year ago now. And she is the person that literally helped put together a beautiful program called The Go-Giver. And I have to say, she is definitely a go-giver and more. And this, this interview is not about the go-giver. This interview is about Dixie, and she's a phenomenal coach. And her nickname, by the way, is Dixie Dynamite. And you're going to find out why she has that nickname. And I have to say that I can resonate with that in more ways than one because her and I are spitfires. I have to say that we literally love to blast through things in more ways than one. That, that her and I have in common. So the first thing I would like to start off with was is actually she has written a book. So I would love for you to share the title of your book, and I would like to start with that. Sure. You know, the title of the book actually came out of that, liking to blast through things and being that kind of dynamite spitfire, which took me a long time to own up to. But it's called Just Blow It Up, Firepower for Living an Unlimited Life. Now, can you, can you actually go back and where did you get the inspiration for that title? And let's even go back further. Where did you get the nickname of Dixie Dynamite? Well, that happened in the second grade. And I have to tell you, Carly, it, I was so insulted because when the kids started calling me Dixie Dynamite, I thought they meant I was, you know, volatile, out of control. I mean, I didn't see it as a compliment at all. So I made everybody, well, I tried to make everybody not call me that. And then it came back up in my professional life when I started speaking and people say, oh, that's, you know, that's totally your speaking style. It's this, you know, dynamite thing. So finally, I was actually at another one of Bob Berg's events. You and I met at, at one of Bob's events, and this was about four or five years before that, and Libby Gill was presenting. And she is a branding specialist, just came out with a new book, which everybody should definitely check out. But um, she's a branding specialist, and she said, where is this Dixie Dynamite thing? Why is this not on your website? Why is this not your brand? And I said, because I don't really like it. She said, no, it really fits you. You've got to use it. So I took a year to really own up to that. And by the time I had, I was having fun with it. So by the time the book came out, I was having so much fun with it. The book title just kind of played into it. It was a long evolution for me. You know, I have to tell you, I don't know if you noticed this, every single one of my shows has straight talk, straight talk, straight talk. Great. And so my whole life, when I was a little child, I was, I was tiny, my grandfather would pick me up, and I was solid as a brick. And I've always just been, because of, a, because of my past and the way I grew up, I've just been, some people would actually call me a pit bull. However, not a pit bull as in mean, just as I was always really straightforward. And almost to the point of, I was always, and I'm a scorpion, by the way. However, I had to learn to use my stinger. I was always the person that was always helping everybody and had a heart of gold. Yet, don't cross with people that I loved. So I was kind of like the person that I loved everybody, yet at the same time, I was brutally honest. So people were like, don't mess with Carly, and she's got a really good heart. And I was kind of like the tomboy. And so it was kind of like, I kind of always had your, I was like the tomboy, except really, really nice. And I can't explain the analogy that I grew up with. It was like a very complicated one. However, I was always kind of like you. Know, I just blast. I would blast through things, and yet at the same time, I didn't like it either. Except it really fit. So I, I can really understand where you're coming from. On one hand, you feel insulted. Now, on the other hand, you kind of you do. You kind of actually eventually just kind of come into it and finally say, "Okay, that's me. I own it." I'm like, right. you know, I don't know. It's a, I I love it. I think it's a beautiful way to be to own up into your greatness, if you will, because it is yeah. a beautiful strength. There's a strength in owning your, I don't know, to me, I think it's a beautiful strength. And that's one of the things I loved about you that's always, I've always admired in you. So I love it about you. Well, thank you. You know, I, I think of it as power. And I think a lot of us are afraid to own our personal power. And in that personal power lies, of course, in our most unique and 
well, you can't be most unique, our very, our, our own unique and, and most authentic way of going about things. And so a lot of us reject that because we're, we're really afraid of, I wrote a blog post actually, what's in a name or what's in a word and that word is power. And so I think for me that was a lot of just kind of wanting to reject that I was a powerful person. And now, even though I've learned to dance a little more gracefully through the rubble than I did when I was a kid, it's, it's become this uh, symbol for me, I think, of realizing just how powerful I am and how much power that gives me to do so much in the world instead of thinking of it being power against anything. It's more a power for things. So maybe you can kind of do the same thing with that pit bull because, because they are the most wonderful, loyal. I mean, it, just as you say, you know, the, the pit bull actually is only able to be made mean because they're pleasers. They want to please their master, and if their master wants them to be mean, they'll certainly do it. But the only time a pit bull who isn't trained to be mean will get mean is when you challenge their owner. So it's, it's very true for you if you think about the true characteristics of a pit bull. Absolutely. I think a lot of animals like a pit bull and other animals that people are, or a Doberman, I think it, it is boils down to how they're raised. How you raise anything in life, how are you raising that animal? Are you raising that animal with love and or no different than a child? You, you, it's what it's 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 their environment and it's how they're raised. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to what you said I think that was really pivotal. I think power in women has been is it's also been I think equally scary. Men in power has been something that has been an evolution that men have grown up in power. I think us as females when we've been the, the word power with women has not has not been in the evolution of us coming in age has not been something that's been very welcoming. So women in general have shied away from the word power or stepping into their power. And I think we are just starting to step into our power. And now here's the other thing. How are you using your power? Are you wielding your power from a place of egoic and are you using your power to hurt or are you using your power to empower? I use my power, and I know you've seen my pages, I use my power to inspire and to empower others. I don't use my power to disempower or to disable others. Right. And I know you use your power, even in the title of your book, okay, you use your power to empower and inspire others. You do not use your power in a way that harms others. So to that, to me, that's the key. I think women can be extremely powerful. It's just how are you using your power? I know. What are your thoughts on that? You know, and and I'm, I'm I I appreciate that you bring up the women you know issue because I definitely think that as young girls, it is what we're taught. It is as you say, we're a product of our raisin, and it's a lot of it's what we're taught is not only expected from us, but what's desired from us. Everyone really does want to please someone. Maybe not everyone, but, but everyone has a desire to, to please someone. So as girls, we are taught that being vulnerable and uh, powerless, so to speak, is going to please somebody. But here's the other side of that. For every challenge that women have, men have a coordinating challenge, if that makes sense. Because when we've taught little girls to be powerful at the same, or not to be powerful, we've at the same time taught little boys that to be vulnerable is to be weak. And we've taken away their right to compassion and vulnerability, and that's as much a part of their nature as it is the female. So in creating that dichotomy, we've, we've done a horrible disservice to both genders, I think. And, and it's important to recognize, I think, both sides of it, or you don't overcome or heal either side. Now, again, you brought up another very valid point and a very powerful point. I think it's going to be a wonderful time in our culture and history when we start to embrace both sides. And I think, again, the whole culture is black, white, up, down, left, right. You know, men are in power, women can't. It would be a wonderful world when our presidency isn't just a president. I would love to see when we come into time in a culture when when it's a time to vote, that it's not just a president, it's a president and a, I think every position should be held by a male and a female. I think literally it should be a Mr. and Mrs. Presidency. Every, everything, every position should be held by a male and a female. You'd be surprised what that would do. 
it would balance out things, the yin and the yang. Everything, the females have a purpose, males have a purpose. We both have strengths that serve. And I would, it would be an amazing nation if every position that was held, even judges, can you imagine a judge's bench that every position was held by a male or female? What would happen? It would be, it'd be yeah. a really phenomenal test. It would be actually a really phenomenal experiment to see what would happen. We would have a very different nation because we would have very different strengths. So I, it, it, I, I know I welcome that we start to honor both sides. Our men will start to show more compassion. Our females will start to show a little more of their strengths, and we start to balance out our country. So there's an amazing it, amount of strength. Experiment. Yeah, there's a, there's an amazing amount of strength and compassion and vulnerability. And so to speak to what would happen if all posts were held by one of each, so to speak, if they were partnered or paired. I feel like every one of us has that within us. Mm -hmm. You know, every one of us has that partner pair within us. When we're free to act, to speak in accordance with which which is the most appropriate, which does the most good at the time. I don't know if we'll need partners, pairs, balance if we're balanced internally. Um, and, and what I see so much in, in all cultures, really is that there's expectations of women that are different than expectations of men. Some of those are natural, but a lot of them are posed, imposed by culture. And those are some of the walls I'm actually helping people blow up because there's this whole, I can't because I'll get this reaction. I'm this age, I'm this gender, I'm this whatever. And if I do that, it goes counter to what people expect from me. There's going to be this backlash. And um, that's one of the bigger walls that people bring up. And I agree with you. And that's why I think if we started there, then we wouldn't need to do that. I just think we need to start somewhere. So I think if we start with the partnerships, that eventually will lead to the part where we don't need that. Except right now, I think in our culture, if we started with the partnerships, that, that eventually would dissolve to the point that we know what that felt like. So I think right now, we don't, you know, it's sad that we don't actually know what that feels like. And I think if we started having positions where both partners were held, that the men would start to feel what it would be like to have the female. The female would start to feel like to start to have the male. You understand what I'm saying? It's like we'd be mirroring for each other. Well, yeah, the, there's a modeling that happens. Right, we exactly. We relate to someone, and we can actually emulate someone of the other gender. Exactly. Um, most of my role models actually have, have been male, and I think it's, it's one of the reasons that um, I'm able to embrace my powers. I've had some really great role models of very powerful men that still have that vulnerability and compassion and, and spirit-based leadership. Could you actually name some of those? Because that's actually a really good point. So what are some of the role models that you think are really empowering for you? Well, obviously Bob Burke. I mean, <laughs> you and I both share that one. Um, and, you know, John David Mann is kind of the, the quieter uh, half of, of that authorship of, of The Go-Giver that I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time around John and, and talking with John. And he's, he's somebody that I feel very comfortable saying that I have modeled in, in a lot of ways. Um, so he's been he's been a, a, a role model for me in many ways. Um, there are some role models here locally that they may not be big recognizable names yet, but they have certainly modeled uh, that that ability to be powerful and still gentle and and um, compassionate. And of course, you know you know that that I spent some time being mentored by Richard Bach, and mm -hmm. I've never met anyone more more gentle and more caring and more compassionate, or frankly, more powerful. I mean, he sets a marvelous example for what that looks like in one person. And what about females? What are some powerful females for you? Oh, you know, I hate to say there haven't been as many, but there have certainly been some wonderful females that, that I have modeled. Um, Stephanie Frank has set a marvelous example. I, I mentored with her for a while, and we haven't stayed in touch as much, but, but her impact is still very much part of my life. Um, my coach here, um, who's a manifestation maven, is kind of her nickname, but Kimberly Schneider has been a wonderful role model for me here. I'm lucky to have her here in St. Louis. Um, and get to spend some time with her. So she, she's been amazing for me as well. Um, we've just been, you know, a, a lot of, of women, and, and maybe true to the fact that women don't take center stage as much, 
Um, you know, not not as many whose names you might recognize, but one I know that you will, even though I haven't mentored with her personally. I, I got to speak hear her speak as you did, but when Colleen Barrett spoke at, at that event, oh my god, she met, is so amazing! Okay, I got to tell you something really really funny. Let me tell you something before I forget. So about a month ago, I had some major problems with a ticket uh, at. Uh, Southwest Airlines, and I so I actually had to get on the on the phone and and talk to them. So I actually mentioned that I interviewed her, and I said, "So have you have you actually had a chance to meet Colleen Barrett in person?" And the person online actually said yes, and she and they're like the actress said she really is exactly like she like she is in real life as yeah. I did you know with the interview, and it was really funny because you know I thought in a million years talking to someone online like you know literally you know how many people do you think online. And a call center. So that's, right. that was my test. My litmus test was: <laughs> I pick up the phone. You know, how many people online on a, an 800 number would actually know Colleen? And they did. So yeah. I have to tell you that. So that was the litmus test. That they doesn't surprise and me. Said they knew her, and they actually gave me a personal story to verify that they knew her. You know, right. so I actually did a little experiment with that. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I just no. Just, that that's delightful. It doesn't surprise me at all. You know, I, I was sitting at the speakers table at that event, so I was sitting right by her, and we you know we were kind of chatting. I was afraid they split us up because we were chatting while she was speaking. But you know, I had to tell him. I said, you know, if I ever intended to grow up, which I don't, but I want to be her when I grow up. I got the sweetest letter from both of them after my book came out. They seriously, she embodies that that duality in one person because she can be hard as nails as a business person when she needs to. I mean she's made some tough decisions and some tough calls in her career and she can be soft as as a pillow when when she you know when when she's allowed to be and has the latitude to be she's just kind of a, a, a big pillow and it's just it's just wonderful to see not only that it can happen but what happens when it happens? Because okay, you look at so, the profitability. So, okay, so for a pre-frame, so can you give people free pre-frame so in case people have no idea what we're talking about? Oh just my goodness. Who we're talking about? So, you know, for anybody who doesn't know, Herb Kelleher was one of the co-founders of Southwest Airlines. And seriously, I could write a book about all the walls they had to blow up. The challenges that they had in creating that particular airline, there were laws created to keep them from making money. I kid you not. There was Texas I know, is legislation that, that happened just to keep Southwest from doing what Southwest wanted to do. Yeah, oh well, you know, they, they lasted through that. Colleen was originally his personal secretary. When he was still in his, his law practice, she was his secretary. And when he stepped away from the CEO role, he uh, basically promoted her to that spot. I mean, it had to be cleared by the board, all that. But he said, "This is the woman who should run this company because she understands leading with love, and she certainly understands leading with love. And that is, if if all the leaders in our country, male or female, embody both the you know the hard as nails, have to make the tough decisions, you know, business acumen of Colleen Barrett and the soft." heart and and just warm style that she brought to that stage a lot of our problems would vanish overnight I mean seriously if that was if that was our leadership a lot of problems would go away that woman is absolutely amazing my interview with her was just absolutely amazing I was, uh, yeah absolutely I was so stoked that she won the go-giver award that was just amazing and the yeah. speech that she gave was even more amazing so oh. anyways, that's, that's who we're talking about just so everybody knows <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even modeling her speaking style, you know, I, I told Bob, I said, you know, this is so much the style that I've been working to cultivate. She didn't so much speak as she told stories, and then she just kind of unwrapped the meaning. You know, she told us, okay, this is what is behind that story. Here's the wisdom that created that story, and it was just, it, it was a fabulous experience. And getting to sit next to her but get the backstory at the same time <laughs> really made it fun. So I would love for you to share some of your passions so people get to know who is Dixie. So what are some of the things you do besides coaching? What are some things that you love that give bring joy and love into your heart? Yeah, you know, it, as most people know, if they if they're following me on Twitter or Facebook, especially Facebook, you're you're familiar with the dragon dog and the little hunter cat and the the baby bear. Uh, we have two dogs and a cat, and and they are they are definitely spirits um, that that are far bigger than their little furry bodies. I love being 
with nature, with animals, because I, there are so many parallels and the lessons that I need to learn that they just lay out there for me, if you're paying attention. Um, is certainly, I, I really have passion for entrepreneurship in all of its guises. So it's not just coaching. I like hanging out in local businesses and, and you know, whether it's coffee or shopping or whatever, I really feel that the more we support that entrepreneurial spirit, whether it's at the, the mom and pop level or whether it's that ownership level in a huge corporation, that's where our economy has hope, is in that, that ownership that comes with the entrepreneurial mindset and the entrepreneurial spirit, whether there's an actual ownership of the business involved or not. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a big, it, it definitely fires up that inner passion for me. Um, books, it's always story. Everything comes back to story. And, uh, you so need all those books behind you? <laughs> oh, the books behind, that's like, that's this much out of oceans. And I, you, mean, a, you mean like me? I have like tons and tons of bookshelves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is just what will fit on the mantle without the mantle collapsing on my head. There are bookshelves in every room of the house, and they're all stopped. I hear you. So those are, those are the big ones for me outside of, of course, just loving what I do, loving to write, loving to talk to people, loving to coach. And so let's get let's back to coaching. What is your biggest passion or actual excitement about being a coach? And, you know, wh how can you, like, so what is your style of coaching? So people can get a sense of if they use you as a coach or they want to use you as a consultant, how do they, what is the biggest thing or the outcomes they arrive from working with you? Great. Well, outcomes from, from working with a coach should be very much the same regardless of the style of coaching. You should be doing things you either didn't know how to do, didn't think you could do. Um, you, you should be getting past the point that you are in working toward the point where you want to be. I mean, that's, that's about as basic as it gets. So the first thing with coaching, or the, the, you know, consulting, you're there to figure out what the problem is and what the solution is. With coaching, it's, it is more about the blockages, the barriers, whether they're mindset, whether they're, you know, based in past experience. You know, you, you know what coaching is all about, Carly. Yeah, absolutely. So it really does start in the mind. And, and a lot of people think that the mindset stuff is fuzzy. That's fuzzy management. That's not going to get results. Any other result that doesn't come from the mindset is never sustainable because every time we make a decision, especially a decision in crisis, it will come from mindset first and education, strategy, or training second. We always respond out of mindset. We always make choices out of mindset. So from a coaching standpoint, people's mindset shifts. The way that they approach life itself shifts and that is reflected in their business because of course my my focus is business coaching um, as far as my style you know one of the things I, I won't do I will not work with people that need to be beat up if you need a drill sergeant boot camp style you need somebody to you know yell at you that you're making excuses or yell at you about anything I'm not your coach I will not yell at people um, I tell people I work with grown-ups, you know, I won't work with somebody that has to be yelled at to go clean their room. So for me, when somebody says, I'm procrastinating this, I don't know why I haven't got it done yet, it's not a matter of what are your ex excuses, it's like what is the actual reason behind their, the excuse. There's always a reason for procrastination, there's always a blockage that makes it easier to procrastinate than it is to do what they need to do, and there are a lot of reasons. So I don't fall into the um, if you wanted it bad enough, you just do it. Um, there is no try. I mean, all of those have their place, and there are circumstances where they're true, but there's an awful lot of times that coaches pull them out and throw them at somebody when that's not really the reason the person isn't doing what they need to do. And so for me, the coaching style is let's get to the bottom of it because when we've gotten to the very bottom of it and we've shifted that, it won't ever come up again. Well, there's always uncon it's the unconscious, you know, storytelling. It's, it's yeah. always the unconscious virus. It's the storytelling. Yeah, it's the story that you live in, and it's how you it's how you self-identify. You know, when you're working with somebody who self-identifies as a person who can't do something because they've never been able to, or they've been told that they can't, or they don't have permission, or whatever it is, if that's the way they've self-identified, that's where they're going to stay. 
So it really, for me, that's, that's where it starts. Now I get into a lot of, of business, actually consulting and advising and, you know, based on my, my, my business consulting background as well. But if the mindset isn't shifting, the business isn't growing. Exactly. And that's why my on all my lines it says mind, body, business, spirit. And that's what they don't get. Because your business isn't going to go anywhere if you're still stuck in the mind, body stuff. And it's, right. it's, it's all interconnected. And they don't get that. They're like, well, what do you mean mind, body, business, spirit? Well, it's like if you're stuck here, how do you expect your business to go there? It won't. It's yeah. not going to go anywhere because you're stuck Your business here. can't outgrow you. It seriously cannot grow beyond your willingness to grow. It's, exactly. Yeah. I, got, I got so many people fighting me on that. They're like, what do you mean mind, body, business, spirit? You, they're not interconnected. I'm like, never mind. <laughs> Next. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I'm lucky in the crowd I've got because people don't fight me. And, and the more I talk about spirit, and you probably know, I, well, I know you know because you reposted it. I just wrote an article about whether or not it was okay for me to talk about spirit. It's always been part of my work, but is it really okay to talk about it as part of my brand? Do I want to just come right out and say, look, unless you're connected to spirit, the energy isn't there. Unless you're connected to spirit, you're not going to blow up any walls. Um, you, you're going to keep beating your head against them. And that's not a religious thing. That's just a simple fact that, that we are made up of those three elements. And unless all three of those elements are at play, we don't really succeed. And um, so the more I talk about it, the more people are like, well, yeah, is that what you've been saying all along? It's like, well, yeah, but now I'm just really saying it right out loud. Well, that's the point. I'm talking about years ago. I got, I could, you couldn't, you gotta remember, years ago, you could not use the word spirit with business. Now, yeah. you know, you can really start to use the word spirit in business. It's, it's like, you know, conscious business collaborations. More and more, you're allowed to use consciousness, terminology, business, and spirit synonymously. Yeah. Back, you know, 10 years ago, I've been using the terminology of conscious business, spirituality of business. God, back in the 80s, and back then, people were not ready to hear that. So, you know, people would be fighting me all the time on it. Now, you know, more and more, people are starting to understand the evolution of consciousness with business. So, yeah, I'm thrilled that you're using it more. I'm thrilled more people are using it more because it is. It's so interconnected. I'm thrilled. I like say it. The more people, the more people that use it, the more people, the more consciousness we have in business. That's why I love the Go Giver because it's like it's kind of like the gate opening the door, the Pandora's box of consciousness into business. And yeah. since the parallel, you know, what I love about Bob Berg, what I love about the Go-Giver and those types of parallel, um, you know, those type of stories and the way it's done, it has opened the gateway for businesses to understand that you can be, you know, you can be a good soul, you can be a giver in a business. And so it's really opened that avenue for so many people. It's just a well, great, you yeah. know, it's, it's been wonderful. So what are some thoughts that you'd love to leave the audience with? Like what are some just wonderful tips that you'd love to leave for people on how to be, you know, conscious, how to be awake, how to be grounded? I don't know, whatever. What are just some wonderful tips you'd love to leave the audience with? Oh, there's so many, you know, that I want to share. And it's one of the things that I keep being told with, with Just Blow It Up is it's, it, everybody's like, it's so dense. It's so packed. There are so many themes in there. It's a short book. Some of the chapters are like two pages. But everybody's like, there's so much in there. So it's, it's hard for me to say what I really want people to know. Um, you know, the biggest things that I, I want people to accept is that we really do have the opportunity to live a life without limits. That limitless is not only available to us, it's our reality. And people say, well, I can't do this and I can't do that. And I say, okay, so how many things are left that you can do? I don't know. Well, you started out with infinite, infinite possibilities. Infinite possibilities. And you've just knocked three off the list. Infinity minus three is what? Uh, now, right? <laughs> so, you know, if, if you still haven't found a way to do what you want to do and to accomplish what you want to accomplish, you're, you're doing one of two things, and this is what I will leave your audience with. You are either being so specific about the design of what you want to do that it's like the kid crying because the circus has left town and nothing will do but they go to that circus in that town at that time. Well, you got it. You can't do that. The circus has left town. But can you go see a circus? 
Can you go see an event in that town with your friends? Can you? There are still limitless opportunities to do what really mattered. Um, so you can sit and cry because the circus has left town, or you can get creative about all the alternate ways that you can achieve what you really want to achieve. So either you're being too specific about your design, or you're not being creative enough about your possibilities. That's the only reason for you to live a limited life. And I would love for you to share, because you did not put your lower third in, which I forgot. That's my, my faux pas. I forgot to let you put your lower third in, and you didn't do that, which my editor will put your lower third in for you. However, okay. can you please share with the audience where they can find Miss Dixie? Oh, I'm not hard to find. You know, it helps that Dixie Gillespie is such an unusual name because it's spelled with an A, G-I-L-L-A-S-P-I-E. There aren't very many Dixies, aren't very many Gillespies, so it's pretty easy to track me down. Facebook is kind of home away from home. That's where I keep all my pen pal um, <laughs> kind of conversations because there are a lot of people that I feel very close to that I've only met once, like yourself, or maybe never met at all. So you can find me on Facebook. Um, you could either find my personal profile at, you know, the whole Facebook thing, and it's Dixie Dynamite, or my business profile is Dixie Dynamite Coaching. Um, my website, of and course. And you're going to say this a little bit slower because remember this is also a podcast. Okay, so slow down. I can I can out talk just about anybody, so I will slow that down. Facebook, and if you look for Dixie Dynamite, you will find my personal profile. If you look for Dixie Dynamite Coaching, you'll find my business page. I do share a lot of business kind of tips, wisdom, mindset stuff on my business page that I don't aggregate over to my personal page. So you might want to connect with both if, if that's what you want. Um, and then, of course, my website is DixieDynamiteCoaching.com. And don't leave off the coaching because I refuse to take responsibility for DixieDynamite.com. So it's DixieDynamiteCoaching.com. And are you on Twitter? I am. It's Dixie Dynamite. I don't tweet as much as I connect on Facebook. So um, if you want a lot of me, find me on Facebook. But uh, yeah, yeah, I am on Twitter. Okay. And if you really want a lot and um, you want kind of a daily pick-me-up, little, little tease, kick in the pants, whatever that may be, I do post a daily email that's just a, a one-liner inspiration called a Daily Dose of Dynamite. So you can go to dailydosesofdynamite.com or you can just go to my website and, and at Dixie Dynamite Coaching and you'll find it there too. That's a lot of fun. And I also wondered if I usually will have, especially when I do authors and especially with a new book, would you be willing to donate two books to, to people that put in some wonderful feedback? I'd love to. Yay. I'll, even, I'll even sign them. Awesome. So um, as everybody usually knows, I put together a wonderful page that will have an embed of the video, to have an embed of the podcast. So as usual, everybody, I absolutely love bringing you valuable content, and thank you so much for joining me. And thank you so much, Dixie. I love being with you because you just have so much spunk like me. And um, please, I love feedback, so please leave your feedback. And make sure you leave your comments because we will be donating two books. And um, we will either be doing a PDF download or if they're really, really yummy feedback comments, we will actually get you, um, I will get some addresses and I will get a book out to you that are signed by Dixie. So be sure to make sure you leave some comments. And so for tonight, I leave you and I will look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much, Dixie. Good night, everyone. Have a great night.